Dear students, in the last two classes, I have briefly described about the basics of uh, footings, the different types of footings, the classifications, the SBC involved in the design of footing and other minor details. In today's class, let us try to go into the most important aspect that is the basic design involved in RC footings. So, we just try to look at the different basic uh, steps or events that we have in this footing. So, the first one we have, we have is the design of shear. So, whatever designs we are talking about here is with respect to the isolated columns and we are trying to adopt the limit state method of design as suggested in IS 456 2000. So, as I just told you the first important step that we always talk about is the design of shear. Now, under shear there are two types of shears that we are considering one is the one way shear criteria and the second one is the two way shear criteria. Apart from the design of shear, the next important thing that we are talking about is the design of flexure. Footings are subjected to the upward soil pressures okay, due to the loads acting on it from the columns. So, in turn the footing would be subjected to bending action. So, we would be providing reinforcements even to resist the moments developed due to flexural action. So, the second part would be the design of flexure. So, these are the two important criteria that we always talk about in the design of column footings. Apart from that there are two other minor issues or criteria. One is the design for bearing and the last one is design of bond. So, nevertheless all the four are important in the design of footings. Now, let me just try to take each of these separately and understand how exactly we can go ahead with the design of footing under each of these criteria. Coming to the first one that is the design of shear. So, important thing that you need to understand here is the footings are generally not provided with the shear reinforcements. If you recollect the design of beams, I think you have calculated the quantity of shear that would be acting at a particular section in the beam normally the support sections since the shear are quite large over there. We would have designed the beam to resist some flexural action. So, we would have fixed some cross sectional dimensions for the beam you would have calculated the flexural reinforcement and you will estimate the shear carrying capacity okay, of that reinforced concrete section. Now, if you just try to match that with the shear that is acting, you will know what is the amount of unbalanced shear that has to be resisted at that section and we normally try to provide stirrups in that uh, design that is in the design of beams. What you need to understand here is in case of footings, we generally do not provide shear reinforcements. So, what we do is we try to increase the depth of the foundations or footings such that the capacity of the uh, concrete or uh, reinforced concrete okay, that is in the footing okay, can independently resist the shear force. So, important thing that you need to understand here is the thickness should be so adjusted that okay, the stresses developed okay, can be easily resisted by the amount of reinforcements and the depth that we have provided for the footings. So, here the overall thickness is mainly dictated by the shear stress consideration. This is a point that you need to remember. So, hence what we do is we normally try to first finish off the shear criteria 
okay, for your designs and then okay, having got the depth we try to calculate what is the amount of reinforcement that we would be trying to put for that depth to resist the uh, uh, bending moment that we have calculated. So, the order is generally we try to do the design for shear and that will be followed by the design of flexure. So, hence since you have tried to provide sufficient depth the quantity of reinforcement okay, would normally be less in case of footings unlike that in case of beams. So, we just try to go ahead and see any of the uh, beam problems and if you just try to compare the amount of reinforcements you have calculated. So, obviously, the reinforcements there would be much more than what we normally provide in case of footings because there the depths would be much smaller when compared to the stresses whereas here the depths are really large. Okay. Next uh, regarding since we have not provided any uh, uh, stir stirrups okay, obviously this becomes a, a slab very similar to a slab. I think uh, uh, one of my other colleague has already talked about how to design a slab there also okay, you have not provided any reinforcements and hence whatever concepts that we talk about over there for share the same things hold good even for foundations. Now, when you just talk about the thickness, so we are trying to check that it is satisfactory from both one way and two way shear criteria. But I would like to tell you that it would be more critical generally in case of two way shears when compared to one way. So, I always talk about two way shear first and then talk about one way shear a bit later, but sometimes in case it is not critical we can always try to calculate that okay, with using uh, higher amount of flexural reinforcements we can always take care of that, but generally depth would be decided based on two way shear criteria. Okay. Now, the most important thing is uh, when you just try to talk about uh, the foundations, so we have two things here one is uh, the reinforcements you would have provided okay, that is to resist the uh, uh, shears or it can be flexural action and you will be putting some grade of concrete. Okay. Now, based on this and obviously the depth. Okay. So, based on this okay, the shear strength of the concrete section gets decided. So, please do understand it is the ability of the footing to resist the shear okay, at any given section. So, the terms dictating over there are what is the amount of reinforcement you have provided that is the mat at the bottom the percentage of reinforcement in a particular direction, the grade of concrete you have put and the depth of the footing. So, this will decide the capacity okay, of that particular section to resist shear which we call as the design shear strength designated as tau c. So, you can clearly see over here that is tau c, tau c is nothing but the capacity of the footing to resist the shear. Now, next one is tau v. So, what is tau v? It is nothing but the shear stress acting at that section which depends on the forces okay, that we have and obviously uh, the, the depth that you have provided. So, this will decide what is the shear stress acting at that particular section. So, our objective here would be to design the section such that always a tau v is less than or at the most equal to tau c. What is tau v? The shear stress developed. What is tau c? The capacity. Okay. So, we always try to do this. Okay. We always try to see that the stress developed due to shear is less than or at most equal to the strength of the uh, section. Right. Whereas, in case of beams this will not generally happen. Okay. It, that is tau v would be more than tau c. So, there would be an, an unbalanced shear that we have to resist that we try to do in the form of stirrups. So, whereas here it is the other way we try to always keep tau v less than tau c. Now, the next thing is we will let us talk about the two shears separately. Now, let me first start with the more critical one that is the two way shear. Okay. In case of two way shear okay, the way in which the uh, failure occurs in case of two way shears is very similar to that of the uh, that of flat slabs. So, even the situation is very similar the only thing is in flat slabs okay, it is also a, a slab Okay, footing is also a slab, but the slab the slab is present above the column, whereas the footing is present below the column. Nevertheless, the way in which the two uh, uh, things fail, that is whether the flat slab or a footing in punching that is in, in two way shear, always occurs under punching shear criteria, and they are very similar. Okay. 
Now generally what we do is we try to assume a value of D that is the thickness of the footing and we try to check whether the assumed dimension okay, is sufficient or not is what we try to talk about. And as I told you in case of shear foundations, uh, shear footings that is uh, sorry footings, shear reinforcements are not provided. So these three things you need to understand. Now I have a picture to the right where I am trying to talk about a plan. I am just trying to show you the plan of the foundation. So this is the plan, the outer uh, boundary is the plan of the foundation. So let us assume that this is some length okay, that we have here for this particular uh, foundation that is. So there is some length L, okay, the length of the foundation and this is some breadth okay, of the foundation. So that is L and B are the dimensions of the footing. Now this A and B are nothing but the dimensions of the column. So the outer square whatever you are trying to see is nothing but the plan of the foundation and the inner square that is in the blue color that is marked by dimensions A and B are nothing but the dimensions of the column. Now when large amount of force okay, is applied on the blue square, so you can expect that this particular uh, column can go into the foundation if the depth of the foundation is small. But when it goes into the foundation, it also takes a part of the foundation along with it footing. So the, the failure boundary as you can clearly see shown by this uh, dotted line that is this is the boundary line okay and this is where you expect okay the column okay to punch itself okay at taking some a part of the concrete of uh, the foundation also in along this particular boundary so we expect that okay the failure occurs at in this particular region so here this particular boundary this dotted line is assumed to be present at a distance of d by 2 that means half the effective depth so as i told you earlier we normally try to assume capital D that is the depth of the foundation. So we can easily calculate the effective depth. So we assume that the critical section where we expect the punching to happen would be at a distance of D by 2 from the periphery of the column. So you can clearly see I have just tried to show a dotted line here, a dotted square boundary over here which is present at a distance of uh, d by 2. So you can clearly see I have marked these distances d by 2. So all these things okay, that is this boundary is at a distance of d by 2 from the periphery. So obviously the dimension of this dotted square okay, would be a plus d in one direction and b plus d in the other direction. So this is how we try to uh, assume the failure surface to happen in this particular uh, case. Now, once you just talk about here, what is the force okay, that would be uh, required to resist this, to, to take this particular column into the foundation. So this we call it as F suffix U, that is nothing but the force which tries to punch okay, the foundation okay, along this particular critical section. Now let us try to see how we can calculate okay, this punching that is this F U and uh, uh, the calculation of stress etc. Now again the picture is very similar to what I have to, uh, explained in the last uh, slide. Now the objective of this particular design would be to see that the nominal stress okay, is less than the permissible stress. But please do understand here since this is a slab, so we are trying to take the equations of that of a slab and I think now you are very familiar with this particular equation. So there is tau v less than equal to Ks times tau c. It is not just tau c, it is a multiplicative factor that is Ks times tau c. You are trying to magnify this value of tau c by some value of Ks okay, which depends on the uh, dimension of the column etc. So it is very similar to the concept of slabs. Now here how do we calculate the first thing is the nominal shear stress tau v. How do we calculate? So nominal stress is calculated as the ratio of the force divided by the failure area by the failure area. So let us try to understand what is the failure area. Now in this case the failure area would be as I told you punching occurs along this particular boundary. So first we need to calculate what is the perimeter okay, of this dotted square. I have already explained that the dotted square 
line is at a distance of d by 2 from the boundary of the column. So, obviously, this dimension is a by 2, this dimension is b by 2. So, the total perimeter of this is equal to a plus d plus b plus d into 2 times of that, into 2 times of that. So, you can clearly see here in the denominator 2 into a plus d plus b plus d would be the perimeter of this dotted square. Okay, and then you need to multiply by that particular perimeter by the depth because if you just try to visualize the foundation, okay, trying to punch, okay, so the amount of cut that you have to make, if you just try to take a knife and try to cut the foundation, so obviously the depth at which you are trying to cut would be for a, a distance equal to small d. So, perimeter multiplied by that effective depth will give you the surface area okay, that would be cut during punching. So, that is what you need to understand here. So, the denominator is very similar, simple. So, only thing is you need to understand that you have to multiply the perimeter multiplied by the effective depth. So, that will give you the area that will try to resist the shear force. So, the ratio of the net shear force divided by the, per, the, the perimeter multiplied by d will give you the value of tau v that is something but the uh, nominal shear stress. So, the next one is K s that is nothing but the uh, multiplicative factor which I told you. So, it is calculated as 0 0.5 times beta c. What is beta c? It is nothing but the ratio of b by a is what you need to understand. So, what is b? Okay, the short side of the column and what is a long side of the column. So, we just try to take the ratio over here. So, you can just try to get that information and please do understand we should it should be always less than 1. It should not be more than 1 at any cost sometimes. Okay. So, if you try to assume that it is more than 1, okay, at the most it can be equal to 1, it cannot be more than 1. So, whatever number you get, so you will be trying to take that and you are trying to uh, uh, multiply over here. Next, the value of tau c. So, this is given in IS uh, code again, it is nothing but 0 0.25 times root of f c k. So, what is f c k? It is a grid of concrete. So, you can get again this information. So, so tau v you know how to calculate. K s you know how to calculate, it is a function of beta c and finally, the value of tau c. So, you need to calculate these individually and check whether this information or this particular equation satisfies. Now, assuming that it does not satisfy, if it does not satisfy, our, our, our next step would be to revise your d, that means increase the value of d such that okay, this particular equation satisfies. So, generally if you are not very experienced. So, obviously, you will try to assume some value of small d okay, and, and if you are not happy with this or this, this particular equation does not satisfy, do not worry. Try to revise the value of d, increase the value of d and try to uh, see that this equation is satisfied. So, generally see that uh, this is more or less uh, within something like 10 percent that means, uh, uh, tau v should be about uh, less than some 10 to 15 percent less than the value of k s tau uh, multiplied by tau c. So, that your design would be economical. Okay. Now, let us go to the next concept that is of uh, one way shear. How do you design one way shear? Now, one way shear again we need to have a critical section. So, you need you can just check this particular figure again. So, uh, the outer square here is nothing but the plan of the foundation and the inner square is the plan of the uh, column okay, that would be trying to uh, transfer the load onto the foundation. So, here there are two critical sections that you need to understand. So, one is this one, okay, this particular line and the second one is this particular line. That means, the first critical section we are talking about is x x okay this is a second critical section okay which is the mirror image okay of this you can take any one critical section here so this critical section is at a distance of d from the face of the column is what you need to understand correct so in case of one way shear it occurs at a distance of small d from the face of the column and it is right from one end of the foundation to the other end of the foundation. Whereas, in case of two way shears the critical section is at a distance of small d by 2 and it is uh, 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 I mean it would be at a constant distance from the periphery of the column is what you need to understand over here. Okay. Right. Now, again shear reinforcements are generally avoided in footings. So, here again the value of we try to use the same kind of an equation. Okay. So, here tau v should be, uh, uh, should be uh, uh, you have to adjust the value of d such that tau v again should be less than equal to k times tau c. 
But here the value of k and tau c you are talking about is slightly different when compared to what you saw in the previous case that is a two way shear criteria. So, for two way it is quite different for one way it is quite different. Okay. So, let us try to see what this uh, uh, k and uh, tau c are in this particular case. So, here tau c is nothing but the permissible stress that we have for concrete again for a particular uh, depth grade and reinforcement. So, you can easily calculate this and this is given in table 19 of IS 456. Similarly, uh, the value of k which depends on the depth of the slab as suggested in 40.2.1.1 table. So, we will be trying to pick the value of k based on the depth of the slab that you have it is a multiplicative factor again here. So, in this case the value of k always would be more than 1 whereas, in the previous case the value of k always would be less than 1 as you saw. So, let us first take this table 19 and let us try to understand how this table looks like. I think all of you are now familiar with this table you have you may have used this a couple of times earlier. Uh, regarding this. Anyway, let me just try to talk about this table. So, in the first column we have the percentage of reinforcements, in the next subsequent columns you have the value of tau c for different grades of concrete starting from m 15 to m 40 and above in multiples of 5. So, that means any number you pick from columns 2 to 7 gives you the value of tau c that is the ability of the concrete section to resist the shear force okay that is nothing but the shear stress so the table would be quite simple to be to to use so all you need to do is calculate the value of 100 as by bd that is nothing but the percentage of steel so we'll get some value over here you know what is the grid of concrete you would be using so the intersection of this x and corresponding y will give you a number which would be tau c okay so it's a very simple table so you can always get the value of tau c the next thing is the value of k that is the multiplicative factor uh, k. So, given in uh, 40.2.1.1 clause. So, here k depends on the depth of the slab. So, that means for 300 or more if the depth is 300 or more it is 1 whereas, for smaller depths it keeps on increasing and uh, the, it reaches a maximum value of 1.3. So, this multiplicative factor k lies between 1 to 1.3 depending upon the depth of the slab that you are talking about that is for 300 or more the multiplicative factor is 1 you will cannot increase whereas, for lesser slabs lesser depths up to 150 it keeps on increasing and reaches a maximum value of 1.3. So, with this information of k and tau c you can easily calculate the permissible uh, stress that we can talk about and you compare with the nominal stress and match okay, and, and check whether it satisfies or not. Let us talk about the next criteria that we have here that is the design of flexure. Now, in case of designs of flexure the critical section always we try to take at the face of the column. Now, the picture that you are trying to see here is for a case where the column subjected to uniaxial moment that means moment acting in only one direction for the column. So, under this the critical section would be at the face and you are trying to see two critical sections okay, at which we would like to calculate the uh, uh, I mean uh, the bending moments over here that is please do understand this slab whatever we are trying to talk about the projection of the slab okay, beyond the face of the critical section in this case okay, would be treated as would be treated as a cantilever slab this entire portion what you are trying to see okay, would be a cantilever slab okay, which would be subjected to pressure from the bottom and uh, you would be trying to uh, calculate the value of bending moment similar to that of a cantilever beam right. Okay. So, this is regarding the uh, uniaxial moment that we are trying to talk about. So, what if this column is subjected to biaxial moment? In case of biaxial moments there would be critical sections okay, both along the x direction as well as the y direction. But uh, irrespective of that the critical section is always taken at the face of the column. So, along this particular direction okay, the critical section would be like this again face of the column in this direction the critical section would be in that particular direction. Okay. Now, in case of uh, circular uh, uh, concrete column where do you take the face right. So, that means whereas in case of uh, uh, square columns the face is well defined whereas in case of uh, circular concrete columns the face of the column is not defined. 
So the code says that you try to inscribe a square something like this and once you inscribe the a square something like this you can take the critical section very similar to that of uh, a, a square section. So this is how you try to handle uh, in case of a circular section. So you have to have uh, calculate what is the maximum uh, square that you can inscribe and assume that uh, replace the circular column with the with the, with the square column inscribed like that of sufficient dimension and take the critical section for your design. Okay. Now regarding the reinforcements. Okay. So obviously uh, here as I told you uh, the uh, I mean once you apply the load and the moment so obviously there would be pressures developed from the soil it will try to resist and as you can clearly see over here so that means this part okay of the foundation this part of the foundation would be pushed from the bottom okay and this tree acts like a cantilever slab even on the other side also it's, it, it acts like a cantilever slab. slab. So here this is the critical section that we are that I was trying to talk about at the face of the column. So we try to take the critical section like this. So this is in elevation you try to calculate these uh, pressures and we try to know what is the bending moment at this particular phase. So this would be a cantilevered slab and we try to provide the reinforcements okay, on the tension side okay, to resist the shear. So please do understand the reinforcements are present here because once you subject the uh, forces uh, footings to such kind of forces you can clearly see that okay this part of the foundation will try to move up that means okay it tries to move in this particular direction it tries to move like this so tension would be at the bottom compression would be at the top so this is what you need to understand we try to always try to put the reinforcements on the tension phase so having understood this so let us try to let us try to go to the uh, next discussion that is uh, in case of uh, one way rectangular foundations how do we provide the reinforcements correct. So here what I mean is it is subjected to uniaxial moment. So let us try to assume that that is how the moment acts. So you have the moment acting along, along only one direction that is uniaxial moment. So when you have a moment like this uh, we are trying to provide the reinforcements that is the main reinforcements only in one direction that is along the longitudinal direction that means along the x direction and here the reinforcements would be uh, uh, provided for the full length of the foundation. So anyway what you are trying to see right now is the plan so the column is subjected to capital P that is the axial load and capital M subjected to a uniaxial moment. So if you just try to see the same thing in plan okay so that is on the left hand side what you are trying to see is the plan and uh, we are trying to provide re uh, reinforcements to resist this uh, moment that is uniaxial moment. So that means the reinforcements run parallel to L direction parallel to L direction over the entire length of the foundation okay. So that means that is equally spaced for the entire breadth. So this is the main reinforcements that would be provided at the base of the foundation. But please do understand we also need to provide reinforcements parallel to uh, uh, this these reinforcements that is along the B direction and in this case that would be a nominal distribution steel that we are trying to provide in the reinforcements. So in elevation the reinforcements look like dots as you can clearly see here there is there is lot of dots that I have put here it is nothing but the reinforcements provided in the shorter direction again at the bottom on top of the uh, main reinforcements that the longitudinal reinforcements again in plan okay it looks something like that okay. So you can clearly understand so whatever lines that you are trying to see here okay are nothing but the nominal reinforcements provided as distribution steel and in the elevation okay this looks something like that is what you need to understand okay. Now regarding the two way uh, rectangular uh, uh, foundations so here the reinforcements would be present both along uh, about the xx axis and the yy axis. So you got mxx and myy so whereas in the previous case we had only mx whereas here we have both mx and my and we say the column subjected to biaxial moment. So under biaxial moments again okay how exactly we try to provide the reinforcements so regarding mx the story is the same that means you try, uh, try to calculate the reinforcements uh, to resist that uh, mx and the p that is due from the pressures you calculate and you try to provide these reinforcements very similar to what we talked about in case of your uh, uh, that is uh, uh, uniaxial moment okay it is very similar 
whereas in case of uh, biaxial case that is we try to calculate what is the amount of reinforcements that we have to uh, provide to resist m y that is direction. So, and we try to divide this reinforcements ok that means total reinforcements we try to distribute ok one in the central band and one in and then, then the remaining in the outer band. So, let me just try to discuss that thing over here. So, that means in the shorter direction that means along this particular direction ok. So, we are trying to distribute or divide this particular region into two bands one is the central band ok as you can clearly see this hatched portion and the remaining is the outer band. Now, how do you uh, demarcate the central band and the outer band? So, I think you have provided some reinforcements of di dimension uh, some size of footing of dimension L and B. So, this B would be definitely smaller than L. So, what we do is we try to reserve ok a region whose uh, width is equal to the value of B. So, this we call as a central band. So, that is in the central portion the remaining portion we call it as the uh, uh, outer band. So, this is what you need to understand. So, first thing is you try to divide the foundation into central band and outer band. So, now our objective would be to provide more reinforcements in the central band and less reinforcements in the outer band. So, that means we would be calculating the total reinforcements to resist m y um, uh, and a, a majority of that would be put in the central band and the remaining would be provided in the uh, outer region. So, let us try to see how we try to distribute. So, it is quite simple. So, this is what I told you, you would have calculated this total reinforcements, this you multiply by 2 times beta plus 1. Let us try to understand what is beta. Beta is nothing but the ratio of long side by short side of the footing. So, when you just try to calculate this, beta c obviously this beta is obviously more than 1 because the longer dimension ok would be more than the shorter dimension. So, if this is more than 1. So, obviously, the denominator would be more than 1 plus 1 that would be more than 2. So, when you just try to multiply or uh, divide 2 by more than 2 this number would be less than 1. So, that means, it all depends on the uh, dimensioning of your foundation correct. So, if the longer dimension is more ok this fraction would be less. So, this is what you need to understand at most longer side and short side can be the same if longer side and shorter side are the same the ratio becomes 1. So, that means, there would be no uh, outer band. So, the entire width would be the central band that would be the problem of a uh, uh, square foundation is what you need to understand. So, the more it becomes rectangular. So, this uh, logic will work uh, th this logic has to be applied. So, that means, you try to calculate that means, you have to find out how much percentage of this reinforcement should be provided. It can be 80 percent, 90 percent, 70 percent it all depends on the value of beta that you are talking about here. Now, the remaining reinforcements whatever you have are left out that means, how do you calculate the remaining steel? We have the total steel minus steel provided the central band will be the remaining steel. So, that remaining steel would be provided in the two outer bands ok you are going to divide that. So, this is how you try to provide. So, it is very simple concept I hope you have understood how we can try to provide the reinforcements in the shorter direction when the, uh, when the column is subjected to biaxial moments ok. Now, again the next part would be to provide sufficient development length for the foundation and where do you calculate the critical section for the development length. Now, uh, obviously, you have provide the reinforcements ok to resist some value of bending moment at this point. So, obviously, the uh, uh, reinforcement should be extended beyond the critical sec uh, section uh, on the both the sides ok of the critical section to a value of L d that means, the development length. So, in this case for design of flexures the critical section would be taken in the same place as we take the critical section for your flexural action. Now, let us go to the uh, having completed the first two important concepts of design let us go to the next uh, important concept that is the design of bearing stress. So, you have got two pictures over there the left picture shows ok a, a, a column on, on a foundation whereas, in case of the right picture there is a small portion that we have here which we call as the pedestal. So, that means, you can have pedestal or you may not have a pedestal it is not a must some situations columns would be directly rested on the foundations some situations column would be rested on the pedestal and pedestal in turn would be rested on the uh, foundation. So, that is the situation and the foundations. So, this is what we have here ok. Now, let us try talk about the concept of bearing stress. So, here the load transfer on the left hand side ok the load from the column would be transferred 
okay, to the foundation directly. So, that would be the region where we are trying to calculate the stresses, the compressive stress etcetera. Whereas, here there would be stage 1 from the column to the foundation and stage 2 that means from the pedestal to the foundation. So, it means there are two junctions here, whereas here there is only one junction. Okay. In both the junctions obviously compressive stresses would be uh, developed and we are trying to calculate the bearing stress in this particular case. So, what we need to understand in this particular case is that means, so you have the contact area over here. So, you try to draw okay, a distribution line something like this. So, when you just talk about the distribution line here that means, the ratio of this slope would be 1 vertical to 2 horizontal. So, that means, the stress uh, distribution or the spread of the compressive stress can be taken in this particular manner okay, irrespective of this side or on the other side. Now, please do understand here we try to define two areas A1 and A2. What is A1? The base area of the frustum okay, of this particular uh, 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 geometry. It can be a, a, a cone in case you have a circular column and a circular foundation or it can be a frustum of a pyramid. Okay, uh, in case of uh, a, a square column and a uh, square foundation. So, here A1 is defined as the supporting area for the bearing of the foundation it is somewhere over here. A2 is nothing but the loaded area at the base of the column or the pedestal. So, this is what you need to understand. Okay. So, this is A2 that is A1. So, again this is A2 and A1. The most important thing here is the two are geometrically similar that means, uh, uh, proportionately like if uh, A 2 is square, A 1 obviously is square. That means, square column that would be obviously here also that would be the, the value of A 1 also would be a square 1. If A 2 that means, base is rectangular in case of a column. So, obviously, A 1 will also be taken as a uh, rectangular uh, base is what you need to understand. They are geometrically similar. Having understood this, let us try to may understand the calculation part. So, here we need to understand that the bearing pressure on the loaded area should not be more than it should be less okay, less than the permissible bearing stress in direct compression into root of A 1 by A 2. So, the product of the two things on the right hand side okay, that should be more than the calculated value over here on the left hand side. So, already have explained what are A 1 and A 2 okay, the two areas. Now, please do understand that you have to limit this value of A 1 that is the ratio of A 1 by A to 2. That means, at no cost this can exceed should be made to exceed 2. Even if you get a value more than 2, you have to limit it to 2. And as you understand, okay, A 1 is al always larger than A 2. So, this ratio cannot be less than 1, but you have to limit this ratio of A 1 by A 2 to 2. Okay. And the next part is this one that is the permissible bearing stress in direct compression is taken as 0 0.45 times F C K. So, that is this is 0 0.45 C K this at most can be equal to 2. So, having said that this bearing stress whatever we are talking about sigma C B R should be always less than 0.45 F C K times this and this is given in clause 34.4 of IS 456 2000. The next part is how do I calculate sigma C B R. So, here sigma C B R is very simple you know what is the load acting on the column say maybe 500 kN you know what is the area of the column maybe 230 by 300 mm. So, you just try to take the ratio in proper units maybe 500 th into 1000 divided by 230 into 300. So, you get the value of bearing stress and you need to understand that that bearing stress should be less than equal to 0 0.45 into F C K into root of A 1 by A 2. So, if you can uh, achieve this, you can achieve this, you have done your design that means, you have checked that the bearing stress is less than the permissible value is what you need to understand. Now, the next part is the design for bond. Okay. What, is the, what is the criteria that we need to have for design of bond? Now, in the previous case, I told you that okay, that means, it has to be less. But sometimes, is if you uh, you cannot manage that. Okay, that means the uh, value of uh, the actual stress is more than the permissible stress. So what do we do? So in such cases, what we do is we try to see that the unbalanced stress, whatever we are trying to talk about over here, okay, would be resisted by providing longitudinal steel. Okay, that means longitudinal bars, okay, or extending the longitudinal bars itself into the supporting member, or by trying to provide doubles. Okay. So, you have got two options that is that is in case 
uh, if the previous uh, equation whatever I was talking about that is the actual bearing stress is less than equal to permissible bearing stress that is fine, but if it is not then we have to talk about this particular case that means you have to extend okay, uh, uh, you have to take care of that stress okay, by extending the reinforcements into the column either okay, uh, 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 extending the same reinforcements or providing additional reinforcements in the form of doubles. Okay. Now, what is the uh, purpose of doing this? Okay, that means uh, uh, the main issue would be to transfer that excess force into the supporting member, and this force can be either tension or compression. And when you do this, trying to put the re extend the reinforcements, the reinforcements should be uh, extended to a sufficient length, which is equal to LD, which we call as the development length. Okay. Now, as I told you, we just talk about uh, providing the launch reinforcements that is fine extending, but if you are talking about doubles, so at least 0.5 percent of the cross sectional area of the column or a pedestal is a must. Otherwise, you have to understand calculate what is the unbalanced force that we have over there and to match that what is the amount of reinforcement that we have to provide and greater of the two that is 0.5 percent of the cross sectional area or the reinforcement required to match that unbalanced uh, bearing stress. So, that you can try to calculate and extend okay, in, in the uh, 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 foundation for a sufficient length equal to LD and in no case okay, the reinforcements can be less than 4 in number at least you should have a value of 4 reinforcement bars over here. Now, when you are trying to use doubles, okay, so the diameter of the doubles should generally be less than or at the most equal to okay, 3, 3 mm more than the longitudinal long bar uh, diameter. That means, assuming that I am trying to uh, talk about a uh, column uh, uh, reinforcement okay, uh, whose diameter is something like uh, 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 say 10 mm or uh, 12 mm, assume that I am trying to use 12 mm. So, that means, 12 plus 3 15 mm. So, the di diameter of the double bar should not be more than 15 mm. So, that means, obviously, I have to use 12 mm because I do not get uh, reinforcements of diameter 12 mm. So, you need to understand that you cannot have the dowel bars to be of much larger than diameter than that of the uh, diameter of the longitudinal bars. Okay. Next, if the diameter of the column bars itself are more than 36 mm, something like that, very big uh, di diameter bars. Now, please to understand how we take care of this uh, calculations. So, the uh, double bars, these bars, whatever we are talking about, that is, if you are trying to talk about in compression. So, obviously, we try to put a smaller size bars okay, or, or less than 36 mm of sufficient area. So, we increase the number and you can reduce the uh, uh, diameter of the bars. Okay. That is calculation you can make, you can match okay, the two. That means, you are trying to uh, uh, replace okay, this 30, match this 36 mm uh, uh, with the smaller diameter of the bars and you try to provide equivalent area over here. And regarding the development length, so you have should have sufficient development for a double both in the column as well as in the foundation. So, what you need to understand is in columns, okay, that is you need to provide a value of LD of the column bar, whereas for the doubles in case of footing, you need to go into a value into the foundation to a distance equal to LD of the double bar. So, that means as you know the column bars would be of larger size, the double, double bar would be of smaller size. So, you can understand that that means into the column you will be taking to a larger distance, whereas into the foundation you will be trying to take a, a smaller distance. Next, regarding the minimum uh, requ uh, requirements for uh, the spacing and all those things, the requirements are very similar to that of a solid slab. So, that means we are trying to talk about a solid slab. I, I think uh, uh, my friend would have talked about the minimum reinforcements, etcetera. So, things are very similar even here. And regarding the uh, normal reinforcement, so please do understand sometimes the reinfor the depth of the uh, column would be uh, flap would be very large that means more than 1 meter. So, in such cases we have to provide the face reinforcements just to prevent shrinkage and uh, uh, shrinkage cracks etcetera. So, under such situations uh, we try to provide a nominal uh, reinforcements of something like 360 millimeter square per meter length in each direction on each face. That means, uh, even at the top, okay, you need to provide this particular reinforcements. This is basically to take care of uh, the shrinkage cracks. So, we try to provide even the reinforcements. This is only when you have large depths, whereas for smaller depths than 1 meter, okay, this is not 
required okay. So, these are some basics that you need to understand with respect to the design requirements of footing. So, having done this let us try to start the first uh, numerical example that I am trying to talk about. So, let us try to see how we can solve this particular problem. So, the first problem I am trying to take here is with respect to an isolated uh, of uh, um, footing whereas, uh, carrying only axial load. So, I can clearly see read the problem we are trying to design an isolated footing for an RC column of size 230 millimeter by 230 millimeter which carries a vertical load of 500 kn. That means, the size of the column is 230 mm by 230 mm okay, and it carries a load of 500 kilo newtons. Now, regarding the soil, so it has a capacity SBC of 200 kn per meter square. Next, you can use M20 grade concrete and Fe 4 and 5 steel. So, this is the column that is the uh, 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 footing that I need to design for this particular problem. So, let us try to understand the data. The first thing is we try to fix up the size of the foundation. So, what would be the size of the foundation? So, it is a very simple exercise to begin with. You know what is the load on the column. So, that is 600 kilo Newton. Now, please do understand whatever load that we are trying to consider is the working load that is the unfactored load. By chance in the problem if a factored load is given you can always try to divide that by 1.5 and convert it to an unfactored load. So, whatever I have shown here is unfactored load. So, load on column is 600 kn. Now, generally what we do is we try to increase this by 10 percent okay, for to account for self weight of the soil that is the extra load it can take. That means, you try to take 10 percent addition for this particular load which we which would be account to 60 kn in this particular case add this to the load and that would be the value of p that we have to design this particular foundation. That means, we would be trying to design the foundation for a total load of 660 kilo newtons. So, concept 1 that is load would be given increase by 10 percent and uh, take that for the design correct. So, here you would be trying to talk about the working load not the factored load. The next part would be to calculate the area. So, how do you calculate the area? Okay, I think all of you know in case of uh, uh, that is your simple uh, uh, strength of materials class stress equal to load by area or area equal to load by stress. So, that means the equation is very similar to that area equal to load by stress, but here we do not talk about stress it is nothing but the SBC of the soil correct. So, in the numerator you have load 660 kilo newtons denominator SBC 200 kilo Newton per meter square watch the units. So, obviously, you get 3.3 in this case meter square units is meter square. So, the total area of the footing that we need to provide here is 3.3 meter square. So, that is the area that we have to provide for this particular case. Now, just try to recollect we talked about a square column of size 230 by 230. So, for a square column we always try to provide a square foundation. So, what we do now do is try to take the root of this is it all right that is a uh, root of 3.3. So, you get it as 1.82 meters and you say that means for both along the L direction and the B direction okay, the dimension of the foundation is 1.82 meters. That means, we are trying to provide a square foundation. Now, as you understand this looks like an odd number 1.82 is odd number. So, we try to round it off to the nearest uh, uh, number in terms of 0 0.5, 0 0.05 or 0 0.1 you can round it off. So, in this particular case I am trying to round it off to 1.85 meters. So, what now I do is okay, I try to provide a foundation of size 1.85 meter by 1.85 meter. So, I hope you have understood. So, I have tried to first calculate the area as load by SPC you get some value take the root of that and round it off to the nearest whole number. So, my size of the foundation is 1.85 meter by 1.85 meter. Now, the next thing is that means, if you are trying to provide 1.82 meters you get some value of SBC correct that is that we are trying to match that for uh, with, with an SBC of 200 to match that uh, P. Now, because you have provided 1.85 the pressure actual pressure would be slightly different. So, now I would like to calculate what is the pressure at the base of the foundation what is the pressure at the base of the foundation 
okay, to uh, 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 when we will try to provide a foundation of 1.85 meter by 1.85 meter to resist a load of 600 kN, not the increased load, that means the given load. So, which I call it as the net upward pressure, the actual pressure acting under the base of the soil. So, that means, so here I get a simple value that is as you know stress equal to load by area. So, the equation here what I am trying to talk about is the load at the top that is the given load not the increased load. So, there is 600 kN divided by the area 1.85 by 1.85. Now, once you calculate this you get a number. So, here the value is 175.3 kN per meter square. So, which would be less than 200 kN per meter square. So, we know that. So, the stress under the soil is well within the limit of the soil. So, this is how you have to calculate. Once you do this, there are two simple steps that you need to do. That is, you try to increase this, uh, that is the pressure by 1.5 times, okay, that is 1.175.3 into 1.5, that is 263. This is called the factored upward pressure. And the next one is the factored load that is 600 should be multiplied by 1.5 that is 900 kN. Why we are doing this? Because we are following limit state method. In case of limit state method, the loads should be uh, factored. So, here uh, 263 is nothing but the pressure load and P is nothing but the applied load. So, both have to be factored and kept ready. So, I would close my discussion right now. In my next class, okay, let us take these informations and see how we can design the foundation to resist the shear, the flexure and check for bearing and bond. Okay. So, I think uh, let us try to close the class. Thank you. Thank you.